Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Bang On Sales Show. I'm your host, Mark Bangs. And uh, as a way of introducing today's guest, as I often like to do, I thought I would read just a couple of lines from his LinkedIn bio. So my guest describes himself as your sales director. And what he says is, you are brilliant at what you do, but how good are you at selling that brilliance? So he says, he says I'm on a mission to change the way the world sees sales and to help you love the sales function within your business. Are you wondering where your next client is coming from? So this is one of the biggest stresses for small to medium sized business owners. And he knows, my guest knows this because he's been there. So if this is keeping you up at night, then continue to listen, right? So he says, when you think of the stereotypical second hand car salesman, a geek certainly doesn't come to mind, but really my guest is a classic geek. Uh, his perfect weekends are spent in the house with a good book or a game of chess. It's the geeky side of him that fuels his love for what he does. So, of course, he can be the, the fancy suit, the corporate guy, or the, the slick, fast-talking sales rep. But what really works in sales, and I love this, I agree with it, is processes. The processes that can be easily followed and implemented by anyone, not just those with the gift of the gab. I really like that. I really like that. So, uh, without further ado, my guest today is Peter Barkley. How you doing, Peter? I'm doing well, Mark. How are you? Yeah, yeah, really well, really well. Thanks. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I suppose, a stereotypical sales guy. You know, left school, um, started a Saturday job, and um, uh, with a colleague and a friend, um, ran a business for many years. Went into uni, so sort of dropped out after four or five years. And I ended up getting, creating myself a really good sales career, you know, growing a small family business from, from nothing. So I was the guy that was laminating posters and sticking them on, on doors. You know, I was at the, the shopkeeper who had the red tape and opened the first day and wondered where my customers had come from. I then left there after 12 years, went to corporate life and you know, had a really interesting career there and did some some fantastic stuff. You know, sort of, uh, dealing a lot with international sales and developing new products and launching new products and all that side of things. Then back into family sales, moved back to Scotland. And, and for me, I've come into the geek world in the last year or so. Um, and as I said in my bio, you know, I want to try to help um, change the world and change the way people see sales because, yeah, I can think I'm quite unique. I'm really proud of my sales career. I'm really proud to call myself a salesperson. I hate people that don't. Um, well, that's not true. Uh, I hate people that don't. I want to try to help them understand what sales is about. Um, and get them yeah, to yeah. kind of remove that perception. So for me, it's a bit of a personal mission, but also obviously there's a commercial part when it helps small businesses grow. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, and, and I suppose that segues nicely into one of the main topics we were going to talk about, which is the perception of sales. So I, I suppose over to you, really, because I I love how, how you speak about this. So, I mean, what do you see as a typical perception of sales? What's wrong with it? You know, talk to me about that. I think thing is for me, it's really interesting. There's kind of two different categories of people that I come across all the time. Um, and both annoy me in, in some ways, but you, you kind of get the sales guy. Um, and, you know, you and I have been to tons of networking events and, and you, you, you see them. Um, you, you go to weddings and you meet people who are sales guys. Um, and they're always asked that question, what do you do? What do you do with for a living? Um, and you hear doctors and lawyers and, and you know, joiners and plumbers and electricians and all that sort of stuff being really enthused about what they do and sort of promote themselves with one or two words. And they say, you know, I am a doctor, I'm an electrician or whatever it is. Sales guys don't. They spend half an hour talking about what they do um, and trying frantically to avoid the word sales. Um, you know, they, they try oh, the best the not to use yeah, 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 the whole industry. And, you know, they decide themselves as key account managers and business development managers or I work for or I do this and I do this. And you sort of stand there and go, just use the word sales. What you do is sell. That it's as simple as that. And you could turn around and just say, as an electrician would be, you know, I'm an electrician. Stand, stand up proudly and say, I'm a sales guy. That's what I do. You know, every business needs them. Everybody does sales to some degree, whether you have young kids or, or you go to a job interview or you're recruiting or whatever it might be. You sell in your jobs and your lives on a daily basis, and not being proud of that part is, is something that kind of irritates me. Um, so that's very much kind of looking within the sales profession, the way we perceive sales. You know, salespeople aren't proud to be salespeople. We try to deny it. Um, but then I spend a lot of time in my geek career speaking to small founders and MDs and you know, lots of people within business. Um, and there's lots of people out there that have sm grown small businesses from nothing to really, really successful businesses. Um, and you can't say to them, so, you know, how do you generate leads? How do you generate sales? And, oh, you know, it all comes from me. You know, okay, so you've grown a £3 million business. 
all the sales come from you. You must be a great sales guy. And like, well, no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not a sales guy. Yeah, I, I don't like sales. And you're like, come on, you've grown a business from nothing to three million. Yeah, you're good at sales. You might not understand the processes behind it. You might not understand your story and how you can portray that story to somebody else and let other people grow. But you, as an instinctive, natural salesperson, you're fantastic at it. So why deny it? You know, it's a part of what makes you successful. Um, and then you get that third category of people, they only turn around and say sales, and you can see them break into cold sweat. You know, it's kind of, oh my God, sales, I'm, I can't sell. You know, picking up the phone and speaking to somebody and trying to sell something, that, you know, that's not me. I can never be a salesperson. And you just think that's, you know, that's all to me being built up about this kind of false perception of the word sales. And, you know, I touched on in the bio. Um, you know, the stereotypical car, second-hand car salesman or your, your, your bad carpet salesman or furniture salesman or insurance salesman or whatever it might be. You've all had that feeling of coming out of a showroom where you've signed a contract to buy a new car and you went in to buy a Mini and you've walked out with the Range Rover and you know, you've walked out and you suddenly have that daunting feeling of, yeah, I can't afford, I don't want, I don't need, but I've now agreed to buy this thing that I don't want to do. Um and that gut wrench that everybody has is the first feeling you associate with a salesperson. Um, so I suppose we've kind of generated that. And, you know, for me, that's such a small part of what we do within the sales profession. Um, and yeah, these guys are really clever and they use language and they use systems and they use processes and they use everything that we do. Um, but they use it for me kind of like for a, a purpose which is not moral it's not based in ethics and it doesn't build a good sustainable business and for me you know what sales is is you use words and you use language and you use psychology and all that sort of stuff that we, we talk about to identify the problem a customer has and that problem might not be your you know might not be something you've got a solution for or it may be a problem they don't even know they've got but you, you use all that to understand the, the problem you take them through a process to then understand how to resolve that problem in the best way that they possibly can. And then you try to sell them a solution. And for me, the ethical and the moral and the really sustainable way of doing that is that even if that solution isn't your product, you should be standing there saying, it's not my product. It's not for me. You know, go to somebody else because my product doesn't fit you. And for me, that generates a really good brand and it builds trust and it builds a reputation. So if a customer or that person ever has a need or a, a question about your field expertise or has a friend has they will refer them to you so you get that first opportunity so you land up talking about your product or your service or your solution to everybody because you're seen as an expert and then as soon as you get that standing in the field you you that's the easiest way to sell so for me lots of people kind of see those negative connotations and negative experiences of sales where in actual fact that you did it in the proper way um it's a really positive thing to be involved with. You know, we're, we're solution providers. What better better thing to do? You know, to go along to somebody who's struggling with something and say, I can resolve that problem for you. That's brilliant to me. Um, so that's a bit of what, what, what I suppose a bit about me. You know, I want to try to change that perception. I think the best way of doing that is to try to offer a kind of an ethical and moral way of of, uh, of giving people education into that sales process. And that's why in the geek world, we talk about being your sales director. You know, we want to be your full-time sales director on a part-time basis so we can be open, honest, we can be challenging, we can be demanding, we can deliver things, we can make sure that, as we say, one of our values, we get shit done, excuse the language, but you know, the reality of trying to get that and enable businesses to grow from a revenue point of view, but also from a knowledge point of view. Um, so for me, it's you know all of that kind of stuff is built together. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's ultimately what we try to do within the geek world. It's something that I'm really passionate about. Um, and I think changing that perception is really important. Yeah, I can. I, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I can relate to a lot of what you just said there. Um, so <clears throat> when I started my business, I really jumped into doing business networking and a lot of it was online. And naturally, a lot of the people that you you meet, that you interact with, and I always used to say this to people, you know, you, you have your skill set, your areas of expertise, but you don't, if you don't come, formally come from a sales background, then there's almost that denial of it. You know, you, I, oh, I'm not, and you hear it all the time. Oh, I'm not in sales. I'm not a salesperson. And I used to say to people, you know, if you're in business, you're in sales, regardless of what you do. Yeah, exactly. And I think the thing is for me, the important thing is, is that kind of need your reaction of sales is something that we, you know, we don't need it. It's something we don't, we don't 
have to understand. Um, and I always say, you know, that you get that. I'm a small business owner now. You know, I've only been in business for three or four months. I'm, I'm gradually building my customers and building my reputation, building my brand. But if you look at that kind of new business owner uh, journey, you, you have an idea and you, you research and you want to make sure there's a business plan there and it's kind of viable. So you think, yeah, I'm going to give this a shot. And you go through the whole process of giving you quit your job and extracting yourself from whichever business you're in. Get a company registration number, get a company name, that number if you need to. You employ an accountant. Why? Because you don't understand accounts, but you know you need them. So you employ an accountant. Mm -hmm. After a period of time, you start to grow your business and you grow your brand and you decide you want a website or you want some catalogs or brochures or you want to start promoting the values of your business. So you employ a marketeer because you know you need marketeering and you know you're not an expert in it. So you employ a marketeer. And that kind of journey goes on through all the different functions. You start getting HR people into your business and all that side of things. Absolutely. But for me, nobody does it with sales. Yeah, sales is the engine of your business. It's, it, it's, yeah. it's the way that you interact with your customers. It's the, what portrays the business. It's, it's all that kind of stuff. Um, so what we try to do is to say to people, you can access that sales uh, knowledge at a very low cost and give you some experience. But for me, if you think about it logically, if you're an expert in your field, and it doesn't matter what it is, you know, making maps or... or you know, HR or whatever it might be. One of the first things you should really do is start thinking about how do we manage the pipeline? How do we get visibility in the pipeline? How do we start promoting ourselves? How do we get consistency within our business? How do we strategically grow the business into the sectors that we want to? You know, all that kind of stuff sells. You know, it's, it's simple. It's, it's how you promote yourself. Um, and people don't do that until they're really at the panic moment. And I suppose it's, it's one of the things I've found really enlightening coming back into the Scottish market. You meet some business owners and, you know, they, they look a nervous wreck. You know, they really are at that point of wit's end. They're so highly stressed because they've got this factory of people to employ and all this sort of stuff. But they don't know what the sales are going to be like in three months' time. That's mm. crazy. You know, to me, it would be the first thing I'd employ. So, um, yeah, but I think that's all built from that perception of sales and it's this trust of salespeople. Um Companies just think a salesperson is going to come in and, and discount whatever they can, promise to their customers lead times are unachievable and you know, promise the world that, that they can do whatever. Then they're going to get the commission and they're going to run off into the sunset, sunlight and leave you with this massive problem. Yeah, And that's all based around that distrust because of the perception of your sales experience you've had when you bought your first car 20 odd years ago. It's crazy. Um, so so just, just going back a, a second... Um thinking about sales as a, a series of processes or sales as the skill set, the profession, why do businesses not, why do they get it so wrong? Is it, does this come from a misunderstanding of not salespeople, but actually selling and sales and what it actually is? Or is this, is that what it is? Is it something else? Yeah, I think, I think the thing is, is there's, 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 there's kind of two different perceptions, isn't it? Sales, you say to people, you know, what, what, what do you need to do to be good at sales? Oh, you just need to give the gap. You yeah. know, you need to be a, an outgoing, yeah. bouncy yeah. kind of person and you just need to get on with folk. And sales is dead easy. Don't worry about it. But then the complete opposite extreme, you have the kind of, um, you know, I mean, there's so many industries to do it, but you're kind of like your timeshare sales guy. Do you know what I mean? That, that almost change you to, to a villa in Spain and tells you your whole life is going to change if you buy this villa and they go through this real high pressure sales process and you know, educate you know, psychology and language and closing questions and open questions and all that sort of stuff to try to make you buy something. They're really the only people who get benefit out of it is a person sold it because they've got a massive commission check and the people who build the building. But yeah, so I think for, for small MDs and business owners, you kind of have those two polar extremes. Um, and nobody wants their business to be associated with the uh, irresponsible, the unethical way of selling yeah, because yeah. they don't think that's what they do. So then they automatically jump to the other side. And think, all you need to do is be a nice guy. That's all you need to do to sell. You know, go out there and be nice. What do you need? Um, and it's amazing. You start talking to small businesses and say, you know, do you monitor your leads? You know, do you have a CRM system? What toolkit do you give your sales guys to go and sell? You know, um, we've spoken about it hundreds of times. You know, it's that that uh, it's that view that you're employing a professional from the sales profession, and therefore, just by being a salesperson, you can go out and sell tons of stuff. 
yeah. where they don't have your toolkit, they don't know your journey, they don't know your story, they don't know what you do or how you do it or any of that sort of stuff. It's almost, you know, here's a phone, here's a laptop, here's a set of car keys, go and sell. And then three months' time, they turn around and say, well, why aren't you selling? Yeah, yeah it's crazy. I, I say um, the exact same thing to people. In fact, I've probably said it on previous episodes of this podcast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I don't know if you saw the post uh, a while ago, it was uh, Forbes magazine or something like that had uh, done some research and they said that 55% of the sales guys um, don't have the right amount of tools to do their job. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we spoke about it last week, but could you imagine you ran a factory and you were producing whatever widgets and you had 100 people on the factory floor? And your ops director came up to MD and said, look, I've done a bit of skills gap analysis within my, my process and sales factory. And 55% of the people in the factory floor don't have the skills to do their job. Yeah. You know, the business would shut. You know, instantly the MD would be, wait a second, that product is going out to my customers and I'm employing people that aren't trained and skilled enough to make it properly in the first place. I'm not going to let that customer, you know, that product go to my customer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're quite happy for the guy to, or girl to, to, to you know, go out in the car and go and visit a customer and sit in front of your customer and talk to your customer, but not have the right tools to do the job or the skills. It's, it's, to me, it's, it's frightening. So, you know, yeah, to me, it, it, it's an incredible mindset. I mean, it's understandable how people have got there. And, and you know, I've met people who are, who are really, I would say, bad salesmen because they use all the sales skills that we have to, to do it for the wrong purpose. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just find it frightening that, that sales is overlooked as a function um, so much. And I think I said to you, I remember one of my first directorships. Um, I went into a board meeting and I'd taken over from a previous sales director and we were 20% behind budget. Um, we had an order that was cancelled by from a client. It was around about 30% of our turnover. Um, and I sat with a board of directors I'd looked up to for years and you know they're all very highly skilled and you know university degree educated and you know had all the systems and process and data and everything in place um I never heard my MD at the time ever swear in my life and he literally turned around he was like shit you know we're really in the poo now and everybody kind of sat back took a deep breath cup of coffee glass of water whatever it might be and then all the different functions whether it's HR or marketing or production or, or accounts or MD or you know, people engagement, whatever it would be, all turn around to me as a salesperson and say, so Peter, how are you going to get us out of this? And you know, that's how important sales is to a business. Um, but nobody sees it as a, if you're not within the profession, nobody sees it as an art and a skill and a process and, and all that kind of stuff and how you document it and how you support it. And it's almost that kind of black art of, because we don't understand it, um, we're not going to try to understand it. Yeah. Does that kind of make sense? Um, I suppose that's where you and I, you know, we're, yeah. we're very common. We go in and let people try to understand what they do and how they do it and let them yeah. translate that to other people. And, um, yeah. But it, it's funny how it manifests in other areas of like, other other departments and, and business units, because, I mean, I, you just reminded me of uh, not to start sharing war stories or anything, but I, I remember working for a, a you know, small SME, basically, Um the finance, there was a company-wide uh, kind of two-day, you know, like an annual sort of kickoff meeting across yeah. the whole place. And the, the, I remember the finance director doing, uh, get, showing us these slides of, of what we could earn on the commission structure. And, she, you know, she was going through and just saying, well, you know, if you, if you sign three of these, these uh, contracts, sell five of these, two of these, and that it adds up to this much. And, and I had to point out, I was like, you know, the, what you've, and you're saying that we can do all of this each Per, like per sales rep, what you've just added up is more than the entire team has done for the last two or three months combined. Um, and you're asking us to do like the, what it equated to in, in just pure revenue was just some obscene number. You think, yeah. did you think we can, like, if we were able to do that, don't you think we'd be doing it right now? But that stems from a misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of what it takes to generate pipeline and, and the, the time, the tools, the resources and so on. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I do find it amazing you know, if you, if you did that from an operational point of view, and I go back to the you know factory perspective, and you turn around and said, right, a widget takes three minutes to mold and two minutes to fettle and three minutes to paint and four minutes to, to package, um, and your capacity in each of those different parts of processes is X hours per, per month, 
or per week or per day, whatever it might be, you'd immediately equate to how many you could produce in a day. Now, as an MD or a, an accountant turned around to your ops guy, I said, okay, we know your capacity is a thousand widgets a day, yeah. but we want you to produce 1,500 of them. What would, what would the ops guy turn to? He'd immediately turn around and say, I want to increase resource. I want to go on to double shifts. I want to do this. I need another factory or whatever else. And there'd be a whole pile of resource and capex and projects and things related to enable that operation function to increase the capacity. But in the same budgeting conversations, you can have a conversation about sales. And quite often businesses will literally just go, let's pick a number. Sales can do 20% 20, 20 more this year. Why? Why can they do 20% more this year? Because they did it last year. But you ask them to then put 20% on top of the 20% they did last year. Do you not think that's at some point about time that's not repeatable? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then I've been involved in a few budgeting conversations. Then they immediately turn on and say, okay, let's so stick price up by 4%. Okay, she wanted me to grow revenue by 20% and grow price by 4%. Okay, I've got it. Right, that's a tough ask. Yeah, see, when you're at that peak, can you reduce your overhead by 10% as well? Wait a second. You, you, you don't have that same connection that, as you say, to go and generate a lead, to, to visit that customer several times, to, to understand what they need, to create a quote, to build a relationship and build trust and convert that into an order. And yeah, modern sales, gone are the days where you just type out an order and chuck it into the machine and disappear. Quite often now that you have to follow that project through and chase the customer up after it's been delivered and make sure it's been delivered on time. And if there's any problems with the product, they'll always phone you and all that kind of stuff. So you build all that time into what a salesperson has to do. Um, but the output just seems to be kind of elastic. There never seems to be any correlation between the two things. Um, I remember having a conversation with a, a guy and they had uh, categories of customers and how often you should call on them. Um, and they were physically driving around the country to visit these customers. And uh, the sales guys hadn't hit the targets for, for years. So I did a really quick calculation of, you know, once a week, yeah, you know, X number of times, one, you know, four to create it, then twice a week, so X amount of times two, and calculated how many calls that guy would have to do in a month and then broke it down to days. And the land up being like 38 calls a day. I'm like, how on earth can you drive around the country and do 38 calls a day? But then you then ask the, 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 the MD, okay, so even if he could do that 38, what information do you want him to get from that call? So, well, I want them to understand what competitors are paying, what price they are, what are the products they buy, what this, what this, what this. And like. So you're creating this 45-minute conversation about all the prequel objectives, but you're then expecting them to do 38 calls a day. That's not real. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that all comes from that, that uh, you know, it's just a gift of the gap kind of conversation. It's very throwaway and flippant. Um, and uh, unable to break that into a process to, 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 to create KPIs and create a port and understand what that sales pipeline is like, that, that disconnect between the two of them, just means that people can't quantify you know, the resource you need to, to, to drive a sales number. Um, yeah. So I feel like, I feel like there's, um, there's a part two to our conversation here um, because we're kind, of, we're kind of outlining a lot of what the problem is sort of understand where it stems from but you know something you said uh, at the start of the conversation was about remember how you phrased it but you know the importance of having to of understanding like who, who do we help how do we help them what do our, does an ideal client look like and what are the the triggers or the, the what's the inflection point that causes them to buy from us and then how do we build that out into a repeatable process or some kind of playbook that we can then replicate with employees um perhaps we should talk about that briefly um because you know, that, in my mind, that influences your hiring decisions, your hiring process, onboarding, training, induction, and then obviously the tools and resource that gets invested into sales teams once they're on board. I mean, there's a lot. I of agree. There, but could you, I, yeah, I, I agree, but I think that's, that's, you know, that's taking a view of quite an established business because, you know, you've already created the understanding of what sector you're in and what your offering is and what your product is. And, and one thing I love about what I do now it's quite a lot of um, small businesses have grown organically. So they've never really understand. You know, they've kind of come up with this dream of, I'd love to create a business. And you'd say, okay, so what does that business look like in five years, 10 years? You know, who are you selling to? What types of products are you selling? What culture have you got? What values have you got? You know, what field of expertise do you want to be in? 
and they organically grow. So they're, they're led by the customers rather than by strategy. So for me, if you actually strip it right back to the, 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 the real basics of your sales strategy, your sales strategy is to understand what markets do you want to be into? Yeah. What products do you need to be within that market? What price points? Who are your competitors? Who are your USPs? What's differentiating from that? Then that takes you through that pipeline of marketing to understand, yeah, how do you market your business? Yeah, how do you promote yourself? Uh, what's your sales hook within that? I remember, I think I, I spoke to you one day about uh, a guy that I met who was, I described him as ex Tory MP, but he'd gone out and cre created himself a website and he'd gone to these like mad tattooed, blue haired web designers and they created them this really funky, cool website and it was awesome. Um, but he looked like a retired Tory MP. So his website was creating all these leads, but the minute he turned up, you know, his customers were like, but I bought the website. I bought into the dream of the website. I didn't buy the dream of the, the X Tory MP. So for me, that whole sales strategy is understanding that and building that up from day one. And that's really key for me for small businesses and startups. Starting that journey and understanding as early in the process as you possibly can, then creates that funnel. And as you say, then you get into the kind of established business where you start to look at where are leads coming from? What does your conversation need to look like? How do you present your quotes? How do you quote? How, what language do you use? What questions do you have? What problems do they have? What products do you need? What are your USPs in your products? And then you take them through that funnel of your marketing qualification to your sales qualification down through your quoting process and eventually it spills out the bottom as an order. But the funnel actually extrapolates massively higher above that. Um, yeah. And you, and that's I think that's the interesting difference between established businesses and new businesses, or established businesses that want to go into a different sector. You know, there's so many people who just sit and go, okay, well we'll sell this product into this sector, so it'll be dead easy to sell that same product into a different sector. Well, the motivation, your know, motivations for buying that and the the problem that product solves is different. Then you have to understand why it's different. You understand the language. And you have to take it through that one. Um, and breaking all that down is, is, is yeah. you know, it's what guys like you and I do um, because we understand the process. But if you don't understand the process, how do you break it down? Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I'm, I'm tempted to uh, to dig deeper. Yeah, like I said, we should definitely do a part two. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, what, what, why, don't we, why don't we close it off there for now, Peter? Um, definitely. Before we, yeah, before we close off, just tell us a little bit about, I mean, obviously you've, you've alluded to it a lot, Sales Geek. Um, but just, yep. just tell us, you know, whether that's your, you know, your elevator pitch or, you know, whatever, just give us a, a about what you do. Yeah. I think the thing for me is, is what, what we, you know, I say, you know, the owner, Richard, and, you know, guys like myself, we've been in that small business and you get to that stage where you, you kind of grow and you, you think I need to employ a sales guy, but you can't afford a sales director. And there's no point because you don't need him full time. Um, but then if you employ a sales guy, you can't manage him. You don't know the KPAs and process. So what we, we basically do within Sales Geek is, first of all, we have a product called YSD, which is your sales director. Um, and that enables you to get access to high-performing, high-level sales directors um, on a part-time basis. So, uh, yeah, however much you need them, half a day, a month, a day, a month, four days a month, whatever it might be in for a very, very short period of time. And we can come and help create that strategy. So we have that kind of YSD, your sales director is what we call that. And then we also have a sales training function that comes and enables uh, businesses to train their sales team on that strategy to make sure the strategy is uh, consistently uh, followed and portrayed right across the sales team. But the real big thing for me is, and it's what I loved about the sales geek part, is we're, you know, we're a massively expanding franchisee network. So I think now we've got 30 odd franchises in, in, in Britain and a few in America of real various backgrounds and skill sets and knowledge. And we use that to create a really rounded solution. So yeah, the sales process is similar, but there's you, you nuances in each different sector. And we have that experience of you know, 30 odd sales directors and a backroom team of about 25 people who can parachute in and really help your business to grow. And that's that's ultimately what we do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's giving people that strategic support. I always say it's trying to take risk and trying to take worry away. You know, I think I mentioned it earlier that my MDs I meet who look stressed out of the mind, I want to take that stress off them. Yeah, help them not worry about where their order's going to come from in six months, print the process. Right. Okay. Um, well, look, thanks for coming on, Peter. Um, like no problem. Right. I, was saying, but I think we're going to do a, a part two. So um, we'll cut it off. There. Um, yeah. Stay tuned, people. Part two. Great. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, Thank you. Bye-bye.